those of you who've known me through the years, like Shirley Steele, who's with us all the way from Austin, Texas this morning, may recall that when I was president of the association and even before that as a candidate, I was often introduced as the evangelical rabbi of liberal religion, a title that was bestowed upon me along with this stole by one of our seminaries when they gave me an honorary degree. And it provoked my daughter, who lives here in San Francisco, where I am now, to send me this uh, card that I've always treasured. Perhaps you can see it. It depicts a fellow with a beard and glasses and, uh, well, the hair somehow all loved off on top, but covered with a yarmulke, wearing a, uh, a tallis over his slightly patched robe with the label, the Velveteen Rabbi. And the question, then do I get to run and play with the real rabbis? Well, maybe when we're all vaccinated, I guess, when we can all get back to worshiping face to face and not just electronically. The great Jewish sage, Martin Buber, once reflected on the wars and revolutions of the last two centuries. And it's worth reminding ourselves that your congregation was created in the era of revolution. He noted that in the time of the American and French revolutions, there were three ideals that were lifted up. Liberty, equality, and what the French called fraternité, which might, we might translate more inclusively as, well, kinship. That spiritual sense of mutuality that we're all children together of one great mystery, sisters and brothers, our destinies bound up in what Dr. King called a network of mutuality. Something happened to those ideals, said Buber. Liberty seemed to go west, primarily to America, but it changed its character here. And too often it became mere freedom from, and freedom to exploit the earth, the indigenous, the enslaved, the less powerful. While equality went east, in the Russian and Chinese revolutions, it became the equality of the gulag or of the mob all waving Chairman Mao's little red book. What happened to the spirit of kinship? It too often went into hiding, Buber said. It was most reliably found in communities of the oppressed who knew that the human heart needs meaning and connection. The goal of the present age, he suggested, has to be to reunite the separated, freedom, equality, and kinship. 225 years ago yesterday, 20 courageous Philadelphians met with English-born Unitarian minister and scientist Joseph Priestley. And they founded the first congregation in America to use the term Unitarian in its name. This was a radical act and Priestley was a radical in religion and in politics. He had dared to say that Jesus had not two natures, but like all of us, one, human. Aspiring, but human. That the divine is best understood as a unity, not a trinity. And he had written about the history of the corruptions of Christianity, indicting those who put too much emphasis on hierarchy, creed, and ritual. But perhaps his worst sin in his native England was his daring to support the Enlightenment ideals of the French Revolution. That was why a mob shouting Christ and King burned his house and his church and drove him 
eventually to follow his sons to the wilds of Pennsylvania to try to build an authentic community in the place where William Penn had envisioned a peaceable kingdom. Meanwhile, elsewhere here in America, in New England, religious liberals who basically agreed with Priestley didn't dare be identified with him or even use the term Unitarian until about, well, 1819, when their spiritual leader, William Ellery Channing, passed through both New York and Philadelphia on his way to preach in Baltimore, a sermon called Unitarian Christianity, the most reprinted sermon from before the Civil War here in America. Just as today, Philadelphia Unitarians let the laity lead the congregation, even when they built the first octagon chapel, which by the way, seated 300 people. And until 1825, when the American Unitarian Association was first formed and young William Henry Furness, at the ripe age of 22, just out of Harvard, came to grace your pulpit for 50 years. A schoolmate of Ralph Waldo Emerson, an ardent abolitionist, a person of deep spirit and conviction. In 1841, he welcomed the aging Channing to come back to Philadelphia to preach about the church just before your 60th anniversary. Now Channing had suffered all of his adult life from the pandemic disease of that time, tuberculosis. He had little more than a year to live. He had also nearly given up on the institutional church as many Unitarians have over the years. The year before he had been profoundly hurt in his heart when the trustees of his church in Boston on Federal Street where he had served for over 30 years, denied him the right to hold a memorial service for one of his dearest friends, the German born Unitarian minister and radical Charles Fallon, whom they themselves had ordained to the Unitarian ministry because Fallon was an abolitionist and Harvard had fired him as a teacher of German and theological ethics for being one because abolition threatened the cotton trade and the economy of the time on which New England textile mills had been built. Channing had made Fallon his personal link to the anti-slavery movement whose ends he supported even when he somehow doubted some of their methods. But his trustees forbade him to hold the service for Fallon because of their own financial interests. To which his response was to say as their minister, I refuse to take any more of your money. Fire me as your pastor, if you will, but I still care about your souls. And so they didn't dare do that. But in the last months of his life, Channing preached for them only one more time at his successor's request. Perhaps his most important sermon was preached in Philadelphia. Although the church visible had betrayed him, he expressed then a, a faith in what I would call the church invisible. That great cloud of witnesses to which I alluded in my prayer. That was what he came to First Unitarian in Philadelphia to testify to on the 30th of May, 1841. He said that the unseen church universal and invisible is transcendent. It's various in its creeds, its personalities, its rituals, its disciplines. Yet it is one from which no one can ever be excommunicated except by the death of goodness in their own hearts. By the way, 
Although our reading today came from James Luther Adams, our greatest theologian and ethicist of the 20th century. It is really a riff on something that Channing also wrote called the free mind that's also in our hymnal. Adams just made it as I think we need to make Unitarian Universalism less individualistic, less me-centered, more we-centered, less steeped in the culture of white privilege and more committed to undoing the culture of white supremacy. The ideal church of which Channing spoke from your pulpit in 1841 was one of his most radical and I would say transcendentalist sermons. In many ways, it echoed one that had been given that same month by his younger colleague, Theodore Parker, that raised an uproar in Boston. It was called the transient and the permanent in Christianity, in which Parker said in essence that you can put Jesus himself aside, just do what he did. Be faithful and courageous even unto death and love your neighbors and the ground of your being with all of your heart, mind, and soul. Help create the beloved community. For that's how the commonwealth or kingdom of God arrives here on earth. And by the way, did you know that Martin Luther King once sat in your sanctuary? 75 years ago, 1956, he was there to hear his teacher at Crozier Seminary, Dr. Mordecai Johnson, lecture about another man of color, Mohandas K. Gandhi, and how he had built on the writings of transcendentalist Henry David Thoreau to develop a discipline of civil disobedience to promote ultimate justice. Gandhi, of course, called it satyagraha, the practice of truth a religious practice now deeply under attack, both in the East and here in the West. Why? Well, because new global markets and technologies have set us all too often against one another as competitors, not sisters and brothers in one global king kinship. So here's my charge to you. First Unitarian Church of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly and sisterly and non-binary love, as you face your next 225 years, first treasure your own heritage. Treasure your own individual heritage, whatever it may be. For each of us coming into the diversity of community is a spiritual journey but don't sink into some self-limiting identity in which you hear nothing from others but their insensitivities. They are far too frequent and far too human. You never should expect perfection from one another. For after all, that is one of the tropes of the culture of white supremacy, which says to the oppressed, make one mistake and I write you off. So forgive one another, which is always a challenge. Embrace one another, declare a jubilee. Finally, face the challenges of the present and the future together. Never think that those challenges are greater today than those faced by those who went before. <laughs> That's simply ahistorical and untrue. I think of my own grandparents who came as orphans and immigrants from Slovakia at the end of the pandemic of 1919, in which they lost their first four children. My mother, born in 1921, just a century ago, was the sign of their faith in life itself a faith that gave me life. 
And please also refrain from despair about the planet that we share. Perhaps it never will be the same as when we were born. So much damage have we done. As perhaps it will never be as it was when our forebears first came here. But then isn't that what evolution teaches? For us, the question should always be, what are we going to do about it individually and collectively? Not just by living more simply that others may simply live. We progressives must also recognize that our more frightened and shall we say, perhaps less entitled fellow citizens now freak out about diminishing resources and migrants coming from the warming global south. Oh my God, they're not like us. They'll take our jobs. While our affluent economy still needs people who are willing to care for us in our old age, to reopen our restaurants, to keep our houses and offices and churches clean, to pick up the garbage. Because let's face it, those who embrace white privilege often don't want their children doing that. So what's the work of this church invisible? It is to speak the truth as it has through the centuries to two realities, that we are sisters and brothers one to another, that we need one another. As Channing put it in 1841, our nature is social. God made us that way. We cannot live alone. We seek for others to partake with us. The full soul finds at once relief and strength and sympathy. And this is especially true in religion, the most social of all our sentiments, the only universal bond on earth. In this law of our nature, the church had its very origin. Secondly, let us confess that we are easily distracted and divided. We become more self-concerned than other concerned. Many now wallow in a crass commercialized culture of individualistic consumerism in which even perhaps religion becomes just another commodity. Ding dong goes the doorbell with the young missionary saying, have you found Jesus? To which the best answer I know is from an old farmer in Tennessee who said, what, you boys lost him again? What we most need is to be called back through voices that echo through the centuries into the diverse, multicultural, non-creedal dream of beloved community, which is now our mission in the wider world. I don't know about you, but in this anniversary, I hear that, uh, that call loud and clear again. None of us will ever be perfect in answering. My perfectionism, I've learned, is just an aspect of that culture that I'm trying to undo, in which even a small mistake adds to mass incarceration or cancel culture. So think about it and try to forgive one another and embrace one another, always with that goal of beloved community marked by liberty, equality, and the spiritual sense of universal kinship. They're palpable among you. So may it be this day and in all the years ahead. Amen. Hi, I'm Reverend Hannah Capaldi. And I'm Reverend Abby Tennis. We are the ministers at the First Unitarian Church of Philadelphia, where our mission is to awaken love and justice in our lives and in the world. We're so grateful that you watched, and we hope that the sermon connected with your soul. We also want to invite you to join us for a live worship service every Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. 
You can always find the link to that service on our website at www.phillauu.org. In these services, you'll hear words like you've just heard, and you also get a chance to greet one another, pray together, sing together, and we even hold a virtual coffee hour after services to get a chance to greet some new and old friends. If you want to support the mission of this community and you feel moved to give, you can do so by going to the website that Reverend Abby just mentioned. You can find that link below, or you can text 215-709-5095 and follow the prompts to give. If someone in your life needs to hear these words today, we encourage you to share this video. And again, thank you so much for watching. We hope to see you soon.